Can you guys see that? That was crazy, right? Imagine being in an actual earthquake. That could be really scary. Seeing the building shake like that. Well, in this book, we are going to be learning all about earthquakes and how and why they happen. So stay tuned and let's get started. Our learning intentions for today. We are learning to use details and examples so that we, we can describe the structure of the text. We are going to pay special attention today to the sequence structure. So we know we're successful when we can define text structure, use a sequence organizer to describe what happens during an earthquake, and then also we want to use details and examples from the text to support our understanding of the text. Of course, always that text evidence one, right guys? All right, let's continue. So we do have our foundational skills for today and we're looking at multiple meaning words. So when we think about multiple meaning words, we have like this sentence, the price was firm and not likely to change. Okay. Or we could say the mattress is firm, not soft. Well, both of those sentences have the word firm in them, but the word firm has different meanings depending on the sentence. So in the first sentence, the price was firm and not likely to change. Firm right there is meaning like it's not changing, okay? But when the mattress is firm, not soft, we're talking about like kind of the softness of it. So while they could kind of mean the same things where they're not changing a whole lot, we're talking about them in a different context. So there we have the words firm. So a multiple meaning word is a word that has more than one meaning. You can use context clues to determine the meaning. All right, so let's try some more. Lean the ladder against the wall, or the goats are very thin and lean. Hmm, what word appears in both of those sentences? Well, it's the word lean, of course. And then, um, let me actually go back. So with the word lean, if we lean the ladder against the wall, right, then we're making it sit against the wall. But if the goats are very thin and lean, we're talking about, mm, they're kind of skinny. So that's a difference there. Now, the next one, the plot of the book was filled with surprises. Or, the garden plot is small, but it contains many plants. So in this case, again, there is a difference in the word, in the meaning of the word plot. It has multiple meanings. So the plot of the book is like what's happening in the book. Where the garden plot is small, that's actually talking about the space that the garden takes up. So your foundational skills activity today that you might have on Seesaw has to do with um, dragging the word that matches the definitions. So it's going to be a word that has multiple meanings, and I'll give you both meaning, like a shape or to make. So there's going to be a word that matches that. Just one vocabulary word that we are going to go over, and that's the word instruments. And instruments, and remember, that's a device to measure something. In this case, an instrument that we're going to talk about is a seismograph. So that's what you can see a picture of. It says in the text, most earthquakes are too small to be noticed by people. Only sensitive scientific instruments record their passage. So again, to, in today's text, while we only are going over this one vocabulary word, we are going to be coming across lots of domain specific words. Remember, those are words that have to do with the topic of earthquakes. So we're going to have to um, watch for some context clues to understand the meanings of those words. So we have the book Earthquakes by Seymour Simon. And this is a nonfiction book. So that means that this is all true and informational. And then we have the Smithsonian mission statement who helped um, publish this book. So it says for more than 160 years, the Smithsonian has remained true to its mission to increase and diffusion of knowledge, the increase in diffusion of knowledge. Today, the Smithsonian is not only the world's largest provider of museum experiences supported by authoritative scholarship in science, history, and the arts, but also an international leader in scientific research and exploration. The Smithsonian offers the world, of, um, offers the world a picture of America and America a picture of the world. And we will continue on from there. So we start off with a picture. They're really trying to draw us in. I wonder what happened here. This is a real picture, guys. So. There's a little background. It says, in 1995, a large earthquake in the heavily populated city of Kobe, Japan, upended a freeway, causing cars and trucks to come crashing down the cracked roadway. So again, this really happened. And you can actually see in here, it has all the cars and like the semis, like literally they've fallen off the road because the road went from being flat to being 
upended, like tilting over. So let's read the text that goes with that. It says, the earth beneath our feet usually feels solid and firm. Yet a million times a year, an average of once every 30 seconds, somewhere around the world, the ground shakes and sways. We call this an earthquake. Most earthquakes are too small to be noticed by people. Only sensitive, sensitive scientific instruments record their passage. But hundreds of earthquakes every year are strong enough to change the face of the land. A large earthquake in Kobe, Japan in 1995 toppled this freeway onto its side and cracked the roadway in numerous places. So that's talking about the picture that we just looked at. This picture is an example of the enormous destruction an earthquake can cause in the heavily populated area. So again, thinking back to this picture, this would be a huge disaster. Think about all the cars that could have been driving on that road. That's really bad. So according to the text, why aren't people aware of most of the millions of earthquakes that occur each year? Let's find some text evidence for that. That's one of our success criteria, remember? Oh, right, did you see say right here in the second paragraph where it says most earthquakes are too small to be noticed by people. Only sensitive scientific instruments record their passage. So why don't most people recognize, recognize them or notice them? Because they're too small, but that doesn't mean that they aren't happening. Let's continue. On the morning of September 19th, 1985, a major earthquake struck Mexico City. It killed 10,000 people and injured another 20,000. Hundreds of buildings were destroyed, including homes and stores, hotels and hospitals, and schools and businesses. This multi-level parking garage in the center right, which we'll look at on the next page, collapsed like a house of cards, while some of the neighboring buildings suffered only slight damage. Wow. So let's look at this parking garage. So you can see right there, it says it crumbled like a house of cards. Again, think back to our introduction and our little simulation of an earthquake. Imagine these buildings are shaking, shaking. And now we're gonna actually look at one. Wasn't that interesting, guys? We're really gonna have, that's really something, that's crazy to think about. Let's continue. So most earthquakes take place in Earth's crust, a five to 30 mile deep layer of rocks that cover our planet. Cracks in the rocks, called faults, run through the crust. In one type of fault, called a strike-slip fault, the rocks on one side of the fault try to move past the rocks on the other side, causing energy to build up. For years, friction will hold the rocks in place. But finally, like a stretched rubber band, the rocks suddenly snap past each other. The place where this happens is called the focus of the earthquake. From the focus, the energy of the earthquake speeds outward through the surrounding rocks in all directions. The shocks may last for less than a second for a small earthquake to several minutes for a major one. Weaker shocks, called aftershocks, can follow an earthquake on and off for days or weeks. Wow. So again, we talked about there's going to be some domain-specific words. So fault is one of those. So that's our stop and think question today. Use a context clue to help you determine the meaning of the word fault. So first, I want to find that word in the text. I'm looking, looking... Oh, fault, right there. So I'm gonna go back and I'm going to reread that whole sentence. Cracks in the rocks called faults run through the crust. So whenever I see it says called faults and there's these commas surrounding it, that gives me a hint that it usually, it's going to give me the definition of the word. So if I go back to the beginning of the sentence, cracks in the rocks, comma, called faults. So it's telling me what those are called. So what is called a fault? Well, the cracks in the rocks. So we can imagine a fault is the crack in a rock. Now let's stop and we're going to click. We have two more stars to learn a little bit more about earthquakes. In 1935, the scientist Charles Richter developed a way to measure earthquakes. Scientists use his scale, the Richter scale, to assign a number to an earthquake's magnitude or the amount of energy that it releases. Minor and light earthquakes are at the low end of the Richter scale, up to magnitude 4. These earthquakes are common, but they have very little effect on people and buildings. However, magnitude 6 earthquakes are considered major earthquakes. They can damage buildings and harm people. Earthquakes with a magnitude 8 and above are great earthquakes. They are very destructive. 
Fortunately, they are very rare. Guys, wasn't that cool? Especially I liked when I could see the picture that we have on this page here, it actually being animated to see how the um, fault or how an earthquake would happen with the energy building up and then bam, they slide apart. Sections of the crust have slipped past each other along two strike slip faults and offset this ridge in Wyoming, which is on the left. So you see how these are not lining up? They used to all line up, guys. Sometimes one side of a fault will slip up over the other. This is what happened along this highway in the Mojave Desert of California on the right. This kind of upward movement is called a thrust fault. So you see here, these are no longer matching up either. You can kind of see the red, reddish brown right there and there. They're no longer matching up and they used to. So remember our learning intention today was thinking about text structure and specifically, we're going to, going to be thinking about sequence structure. So readers can find evidence in an informational text by looking at how the author organizes the information. That's the text structure. Text structure is the way information is organized. Common text structures include sequence, or sometimes we call that chronological, description, cause and effect, compare and contrast, and problem and solution. Today, we're focusing on that sequence chronological text structure. We're going to use this structure to describe what happens during an earthquake. So let's look at page eight. So again, on page eight, it was describing to us what happens during an earthquake. So it says most of earthquakes, most earthquakes take place in Earth's crust, a five to 30 mile deep layer of rocks that covers our planet. Cracks in the rocks called faults run through the crust. In one type of fault called a strike slip fault, the rocks on one side of the fault try to move past the rocks on the other side, causing energy to build up. Oh, okay, so it's starting to tell us what's happening. For years, frictions will hold the rocks in place, but finally, and that word finally is giving us a hint that this is a sequence um, structure, like a stretched rubber band, the rocks suddenly snap past each other. That place where that happens is called the focus of an earthquake and so on. So let's pause and let's look at our sequence of events graphic organizer. So really this is just a list and you could list things in order. If you didn't have this, you could just literally write on your paper like one and write what happens. Two, this happens. Three. Okay. But today I have our handy dandy little organizer here that we can fill out. So the first thing that happened, it says, is that the rocks try to move. So it's telling us in the text, well, first those rocks, they're trying to move. And then let's see, it said rocks on one side of the fault tried to move past the rocks on the other side, causing energy to build up. For years, friction will hold the rocks in place. All right, so let's add this to our graphic organizer. So it says it caused rocks try to move, but ener so energy builds up and friction holds the rocks in place. And friction is when things are rubbing together. You know, if you like rub your hands together and it starts to feel warm, that's friction. But there's so much friction that rocks can't slide past each other. So let's think, let's see what happens next after those, we're thinking about the friction holding the rocks in place. So it says for years, okay, friction will hold the rocks in place. But finally, like a stretched rubber band, the rocks suddenly snap past each other. The place where this happens is called the focus of an earthquake. So the rocks snap past each other and this is called where it happens, that's called an earthquake. So the rocks snap past each other. I added that as the fourth thing. And the earthquake's energy speeds outward. Mm. Let's see. It says from the earth, from the focus, the energy of the earthquake, earthquake speeds outward. That's what I just put. And it says this from the surrounding rocks in all directions. The shocks may last for less than a second for a small earthquake to several minutes for a major one. Weaker shocks called aftershocks can follow an earthquake on and off for days or weeks. So what happens after the earthquake? Well, unfortunately, then we have aftershocks, which are basically like more, more earthquakes, but just smaller in size. So let's go back to those learning intentions. So we are learning to use details and examples. So that's text evidence. So that way we can describe the structure of a text. Well, we talked about how this is a sequence and we talked, and so defining text structure, remember we said that is how the text is organized, how the author organizes the information. Check. We used a sequence organizer to describe what happened during an earthquake. We did that together. Check. And did we use details and examples from the text to support our understanding? Did we go back and use that text evidence? 
Yeah, we sure did. Everything I put in that graphic organizer came right from the text. So check. So you are ready for your reading response. Your reading response today is what types of damage caused, um, caused by the earthquakes are described in the text. Be sure to answer in complete sentences and use evidence from that text. So again, that was part of our success criteria is to be able to use text evidence. So I want you and I will give you the pages to describe the damage that earthquakes cause that was described in the text today. All right, that is all for today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Be kind to one another, do all of your work, and I will see y'all later. Bye.